Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Dale Mulcahy, Matt Zaglin, and Scott Hepburn. Coming up on DTNS, Patrick Norton checks in on the chip shortage and how much easier it is to find the computer stuff you're looking for, plus what Meta's new Meta account means for Oculus users, and what the heck is a co-tweet, and why would I want it? (laughs) This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 7th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From the St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. It's the St. Louis, Missouri, not any old St. Louis, Missouri. The I'm uh, I, I have to I have to admit I'm I'm struggling with a cat invasion on my desk right now, and uh, the cat has managed to shove my keyboard off. There's a lot <laughs> There's a lot going on your here. Your cat has been playing with your keyboard since like our prep meeting an hour ago. Like, what is up with I the just, cat today? I, I, the cat wandered off and came back for the show. That's what. Tell I'm the say. cat they need to get in touch with Roger if they would like to be on the show. <laughs> And we can take care I'll do of that. that. In the meantime, I take production so well. <laughs> let's start with a few tech things you should know. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the FBI, and the Treasury Department issued a joint advisory warning of North Korean backed threat actors deploying the Maui ransomware against healthcare and public health organizations. The FBI said it began responding to and detecting multiple attacks in May 2021. Compared to other ransomware, Maui requires manual deployment on a compromised network with operating targeting specific files for encryption. The advisory also provided indicators of compromise for Maui. This was a much more detailed and much more practical announcement than one that uh, the heads of FBI and MI5 issued against potential Chinese spying. Oh, my goodness. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman says his sources say Apple plans to launch an extreme sports version of the Apple Watch. Extreme. And now I'm thinking about Harold and Kumar. This year, the watch would reportedly have a 7% larger display, extreme stronger metal case that is not aluminum, I'm going to guess titanium, and a larger battery because you're in the middle of nowhere, being extreme. It may be able to detect elevation and fevers as well. I myself would like to vote for a panic detection alarm. (laughs) Yeah, if you've got a fever at elevation, you probably need panic detection too. (laughs) Uh, Reddit launched an avatar marketplace Thursday that uses NFTs to tie the avatars to a purchaser's account. Uh, This is another example of of not just issuing NFTs out on an open blockchain, but using NFTs for tracking purposes. Uh, The Ethereum-compatible Polygon blockchain will mint the NFTs, but buyers will use Reddit's built-in vault wallet to manage their purchases. So basically, anyone can use a credit or debit card, buy them, and access them in their Reddit app. Uh, You won't have to get a separate wallet or manage cryptocurrency or anything like that. The avatar is licensed for use on Reddit, and you can custom it customize its look with items from an avatar builder. If you're a member of r slash collectible avatars, you might get an invite to buy the NFTs, and then they're going to open it up to everybody within the next few weeks. Prices range from 10 bucks to 100 bucks. That's an expensive avatar. Inside EV, notice that a fact sheet on EV charging published by the U.S. Executive Branch on June 28th started, stated, excuse me, later this year, Tesla will begin production of new supercharger equipment that will enable non-Tesla EV drivers in North America to use Tesla superchargers. Mm. Tesla opened up its superchargers in Europe last year. In Europe, non-Tesla drivers use the Tesla smartphone app to activate the chargers for their cars. However, in the U.S., non-Tesla drivers would also need an adapter. Ah, that, so it's more complicated. So Got it. Uh, TechCrunch sources say India's Glance, uh, which is partially backed by Google, plans to launch its lock screen platform on Android in the U.S. within a couple months. Glance delivers casual games and media supported by ads to around 400 million smartphones in Asia already. In those markets, though, it partners with the handset makers. In the U.S., it'll reportedly be partnering with the carriers. All right, let's talk about Meta changing the way you access your Oculus. Oh my goodness! Kick us According out there. Code ref- Sorry. <laughs> According to code references from Meta's Oculus iPhone app discovered by developer Steve Moser, its upcoming high-end mixed reality headset known as Project Cambria will be called the MetaQuest Pro. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources say it will cost more than a thousand dollars, and when it comes along, you won't need a Facebook account to log in. Kind of. Kind of. It it literally won't be a Facebook account. Uh, In 2020, Facebook started requiring users to log into the Quest VR headsets with a Facebook account. 
Users with an Oculus account were given until January 1st, 2023 to make that switch. That's still the case. However, at the time, a lot was made of the requirement, which I saw essentially as a backend change. Oculus's login system predated Facebook's acquisition of Oculus. So this was a way to get everyone on the same system. And Facebook already owned the Oculus data. The new system did not require Oculus users to use Facebook, just use Facebook to log into Oculus. Well, it just made them look at Facebook when they logged into Oculus. No, in any case, in theory, that, at least. Honestly. Yeah. Okay. It, I think it was just the idea of having mm -hmm. to have a Facebook mm -hmm. login. Sure. Getting back... The system separated data from Oculus and Facebook. You could keep your VR name, unlike Facebook that requires real names, and you could keep separate friends lists, which I can see being incredibly useful for many users. Right. So again, I, I was looking at this like, if you just hate Facebook, then sure, I get it. But uh, but honestly, this this feels like more of a technical change than a policy change, since they already had all your data anyway. Uh, <laughs> it seemed like back then the idea was that Facebook, the company, was trying to be the company, not just the social network. So it would be the name sure. of the login for everything. However, since that time, Facebook changed the company name to Meta. And on Tuesday, Meta announced that in August, new, I'm sorry, on Thursday, Meta announced that in August, new Meta accounts will be rolled out for logging into quests that are separate from Facebook, the social network. So you will no longer log in with a Facebook account. You'll log in with a newly created Meta account. Now, those Meta accounts will have to have a Meta Horizon profile, which is the VR social network, but they will not be linked to Facebook's social network in any way. Uh, if you're a current user that logs in with Facebook, you will need to create a Meta profile in August. Uh, people still using the old Oculus logins can keep using those until January 1st, 2023, but you're going to have to create your Meta profile by the end of the year. And if you want to, you will still be able to link to a Facebook or Instagram account, but you won't have to. And you, you didn't have to before, but you still won't have to. Uh, the changes will have new features. People will be able to have multiple meta accounts now. Facebook account only allowed you to have one account. You could have a VR name separate from your real name, but you could only have one account. Now you'll be able to have multiple accounts. Uh, and suspensions on Facebook will not affect access on meta. That was one downside of the unified account. If your huh. Facebook account went away, your login to the Oculus went away. So, sorry, I'm just thinking of all the ways that could happen. I, okay, so I look at this, and my immediate response uh, is kind of like, what is the point of this? Are they trying to distance Facebook from Meta? Did Oculus sales tank when they did the Facebook login, which, as you point out, technically is not Facebook, but... I, I, I'm not sure I understand why. Is yeah. this a technical thing? Is this a marketing thing? Is this a... You know, we're making the way for the new virtual world. So when the black sun opens, you'll have a fresh experience. I'm just, <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> I, I, I think it's multiple things, as these things often are. When they switched from Oculus to Facebook back in 2020, as I said before, I imagined that that probably started with some database manager saying, hey, we've got this legacy database from Oculus from before we owned them. It'd be really good if we could just merge all of that into one login thing so we can manage it. And then someone else said, well, let's just use the Facebook login because there are some other advantages to that. We might be able to nudge some more people into using Facebook and we already have their data, but it's easier <laughs> to manage it that way. This feels like Facebook saying, not that sales are tanking, but having <laughs> Facebook on there distracts from our purpose of renaming the company Meta. Renaming the company Meta was to say, Facebook is a social network. There are other things we do that are not related to Facebook. Some of those reasons are because of bad press. Some of those reasons are just, they don't want the confusion. They don't want people to think right. that it has something to do with the social network. So having a Meta account makes sense in that respect of having a Google account to log into YouTube, right? Let's have a Meta account that you use to log into things that is separate from Facebook so that we can do things like give you multiple profiles that we couldn't do under that Facebook system. So there might even be some technical reasons in there. I feel like all this would be so much simpler if Facebook just hadn't done, hadn't done so many nefarious things with data and users. And I, okay, I, is this one of those moments where we just kind of wait with bated breath to see what exciting things evolve out of the meta evolution? Honestly, I don't think anything is, I think people are making a way bigger <laughs> deal out of this. kept a straight face, you know, for a like, few seconds yeah. just for you, Tom. Like, it's just, 
it's just a login, right? Like it's not that big of a just deal. A login. How many times, just if you think login. back, think back, how many times did Yahoo buy a company and then say, oh, from now on, you'll log into Flickr with your Yahoo account and we'll slowly merge you over. <laughs> this is this this has all been that kind of thing which, where there's a company that's like, oh, we want to handle logins in a little different way. I don't know. You know, at this point, I'm really bitter because Dark Sky, my favorite weather app on iOS, is finally going away on iOS at the end of this year. So I'm probably not in a rational mood as far as acquisitions, changes, logins. And your experience will be the same just with a different login until we end the company that you love so much that yeah. we bought because we don't understand how to make new products. This won't make yeah, you I feel think. any better, but <laughs> they'll end the company whether they change the login or not. They, they, they're not necessarily linked. No comment. <laughs> let's let's move on to something that will make me confused. <laughs> Twitter began testing a new feature called co-tweets. As you might guess from the name, it lets two users co-author a tweet. Wow, you're thinking editing, working together, collaborative. Well, okay, so some users are going to have access to it for a limited amount of time. But really, how is it going to work, Tom? Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah. it starts logically. One author starts the tweet. And then if you have access to this feature, you can select the co-tweet icon uh, and pick a co-author from your list of followers. So anybody that follows you, you can co-author with. You press send invite and the co-author receives the invite in their DM where they can accept or decline. Uh, if, if, it, if they accept, the tweet posts to both authors' timelines. If they decline, the tweet's deleted. Uh, a few other considerations here. Only the first author can pin the tweet to their profile. That feels like a technical way they implemented it. Uh, you cannot pay to promote a co-tweet yet. I bet they'll figure yes. that out if it catches on. Uh, <laughs> the first author moderates the replies. So if you start the process, you're in charge of moderation. Uh, the first author can also delete the tweet at any time without the second author's uh, approval. The second author can only revoke their own participation, which would remove their name from it, but it wouldn't delete it. Uh, it would just become a regular tweet from the original author but here's the best part path patrick and you, and you alluded to this you may have noticed that you write the tweet you invite the person if they accept it posts co-tweets cannot be edited at any point after the invite is sent which means if you need to agree on what it says before you send the invite you're gonna have to do that in dms or some other way once you send the invite that tweet's locked in so basically they're recreating the experience of doing a press release with a major multinational corporation, <laughs> which is here's our press release involving you. Yeah. Can you sign off on that? Thanks so much. Well, um, I, I get the I, I actually am one of the very few people who understands why Twitter doesn't want to do an edit button and I'm fine with it. I, sure. I, I wouldn't mind if they implemented one. There's some great ways to implement them out there, but I, I, that, I'm not one I, of those people who rages against this. However, this is a prime example of where you do need editing, where you should send a draft to someone who says, oh, yeah, right. I like that how it is. Or, hey, I'd like to edit it this way. And they send it back. Yeah. You can use the trade system from any fantasy sports engine as a model for that. Um, yeah, no, I, first of all, I agree with you. I think once you've posted a tweet, you should not be able to edit it for any of a number of reasons. Kill it, post a new tweet. I'm fine with that. But literally, this is this sounds co-tweet. It sounds collaborative, like right. you might be co-working on a co-released co-tweet instead of document. Um, I'm also I'm also laughing because I, I was I was working with an organization that had a very unusual tool in place that they thought of as a collaborative writing tool, mm -hmm. and it was not Google Docs. Uh, it was essentially a online storage system that had a document editor, but anytime anyone made a change, it changed the document and eliminated all of the other work that it had been done and resaved the document out. And even that, because at least the two people could go back and forth, would have been a step beyond what this is, which is, I made a thing. You yeah. want to release the thing with me? It's a co thing. You basically uh, have to you have to agree on the thing before you go into this process. And then this is the process to get it published. Um, if you're wondering, like, why would anyone want this? I, I can definitely see brands wanting to do this. Uh, sure. Lisa from Blackpink shows up in Paris Fashion Week with Celine. And so the Celine account and Lisa's account, they do a co-tweet or 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 just music collabs. Psy and, and Suga uh, combine on that, that. And they both want to do a co-tweet promoting the song. There's, there's plenty of those kinds of reasons I could see. 
I I get that. I feel that. I just feel that they could have made this less awkward. Or unless oh, for you sure. know, what yeah. we are looking for, what, maybe what we are looking at is bugs are actually features because the marketing companies that desperately want to do this find it easier if the talent or the sponsees or the influencers or whatever it is can't actually tweak their perfect branded message. Or, or that we're going to have meetings to discuss what goes into this finely crafted tweet before we ever get to the point of putting it in a compose box, right? You know? <laughs> That would seem reasonable, especially yeah. given some of the things that randomly pop up. On this isn't, high profile this isn't me saying like, you know, like, uh, thank goodness Boris Johnson resigned before Justin Robert Young went on his uh, vacation and then trying to get Justin to co-tweet it with me, which is how I was going <laughs> to test this, but I didn't get access to it. So. Darn it. <laughs> Uh, folks, if you're feeling social, uh, get in touch with the DTNS audience on Twitter. We can't co-tweet with you yet, but we'd love to hear from you. At DTNS Show is our account. Uh, or on Instagram, DTNS Picks. Or on TikTok, Daily Tech News Show. There's nothing there yet, but who knows when there might be. So follow it and find out along with us. Along with the decline in consumer PC sales we mentioned earlier this week, the price of memory has also come back down to earth. Trendforce estimates the contract price for DRAM fell 10.6% on the year last quarter and is still falling. Contract price is the price amongst people who are contracting to have flash made for their products. It's not your retail price, but it affects the retail price. NAND flash memory has not declined as much, but... Wall Street Journal points out that's due to a contamination issue at two factories earlier this year that reduced production and temporarily lowered supply. That effect is now starting to fade. So you may see NAND flash memory prices start to fall too. Demand for a lot of chips is falling because of the economy. The crash in cryptocurrencies reduced the demand for people who build mining rigs. That's what we talked about earlier this week. Inflation and other economic headwinds are reducing consumer demand. And we've got new evidence of that. Ampere analysis forecast that the global video games market will decline by 1.2% this year after growing 26% between 2019 and 21. Uh, so it'll still be up. It just won't right. be growing uh, this next year. What does that mean for you? Well, The Verge's Sean Hollister has an article up called The GPU Shortage is Over. Hollister found he could buy the NVIDIA RTX 3070 Ti Founders Edition at MSRP on Best Buy, although he did have to go into the store to pick it up. He couldn't have it shipped to him. Uh, he's also been doing the Lord's work tracking eBay prices uh, and found that these have now hit MSRP as well, on average. Uh, used GPU average prices are also starting to dip, dip below MSRP. Uh, Hollister found some new cards above MSRP here and there and points out that next-gen GPUs are still coming, though NVIDIA did push them off until late autumn. But it's altogether a better picture than it has been for a while. Patrick, what are you finding out there? Oh, my goodness. Um, so I kind of I saw this. I retreated it. Big fan of Sean's work. Big fan of watching the way he's been tracking these prices. Uh, I also want to kind of key in something that you said a second ago. eBay prices are closing in on MSRP or less than MSRP. That is, I believe, for used cards, mm -hmm. which is important to remember, which Generally speaking, if, if it's used and not vintage, antique, or collectible, the prices would hopefully be lower than what they would cost new. Um, I was kind of fascinated because I was like, oh, he bought a card for MSRP and immediately went up to, you know, my local computer store is essentially Micro Center. I went on Micro Center's webpage and I was like, this is not MSRP. There was a 3090 for like $50 under MSRP on sale. But okay. when I was looking for things like 3050s, 3060s, 3070s, not at or below MSRP significantly higher. So I was like, well, okay, was that a flash in the pan with, with Best Buy? And I went and I was able to, you know, dig in and open up my Best Buy account. And, you know, there was a, a, a really, uh, I'll call it an amusing waiting show, sort of waiting process where it was like, you know, we're checking the queue, we're lining you up, we're looking at the things. And uh, it was a very peculiar process, but eventually it did say, okay, you can pick it up, you know, at your local store, on the 13th or a store nine miles away on the 10th and pay your money. And it was, I was just, I literally sat there and stared, right? For several minutes <laughs> yeah. um, because it was an actual new GPU at MSRP. Um, 
which is so weird. Uh, you know, a few months ago, we mentioned that cards were available. And, you know, if, you know, Ethereum had kind of changed the whole mining scene. All of a sudden, cards seemed to be showing up. You know, the prices weren't exactly dropping, but you can actually walk into a store or go to an online source and buy a card. Then the prices started coming down. You know, I, it's, it's, I'll, I'll say it right now. The cheaper the card is, the harder it's going to be to find for MSRP. Yeah. Um, I just, I just feel that's the cruel reality. Uh, you know, I'm still also laughing at a 3090 for $50 under MSRP, but, you know, 3090s are insanely expensive. Uh, to begin with. So it didn't feel like a discount, even though it was technically a discount under MSRP. But, you know, if you're looking for something like this, there are outlets out there where the prices, I, I guess the, to, to, to babble a bit less and, and give some focused advice shop everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Amazon, not so much best buy. Absolutely. Uh, based on this because they had 3070s and they still had 3070 TIs that they're getting in, I, I guess, on a regular shipment. Um, there's not a lot of options out there from Best Buy. There's like the card they have at MSRP and lots of cards for more than MSRP. Um, but, you know, shop everywhere. Uh, you know, Amazon, Newegg, Best Buy, your local computer store, um, Micro Center. There's lots of other options out there. Uh, and, and keep a track of the prices. And, you know, again, like we said a few months ago, hey, you can actually buy a card now. So if you've been sitting, you know, wondering if you'll ever be able to buy a card again, the answer is yes. You know, will you ever be able to buy a card again in an MSRP? Well, the answer is for at least two cards from <laughs> one source, yes. <laughs> right. You know, and, and I, I, so, was, I was texting with Sean about this and he pointed out, he's like, the shortage is over. The prices right. may not have stabilized. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the shortage is the thing that is, is now gone like you can find the right. cards you you won't it won't even be shocking to find the cards now we get to the point of like we can occasionally even find them at msrp or below possibly depending I, i'm still feeling shocked there's a whole bunch of inventory uh i, yeah. I will because it's been a couple of years and i'm old and apparently it takes me a while to become unshocked at things like that um it'll i think it'll still be shocking to find stuff at, at msrp for a while it's also curious to watch like you mentioned dram prices coming down you know the words glut have been starting to show up mm -hmm. again in terms of reporting about that or that you know the semiconductor uh, you know, sales will or semiconductor production will catch up with the demand. Uh, I am just all in favor of this and looking forward to it and would like it to happen faster. Just yeah. in case anybody out there with the magic button can hit that. <laughs> when, when we did our predictions episode in December, I, I made the prediction that the chip shortage would end by the end of this year. Uh, Stephanie Humphrey very nicely commended my optimism, uh, even though she differed with me on the prediction. Yeah. Now I'm starting to feel like maybe it's a monkey's paw situation where I might end up being right, but not for <laughs> any of the reasons that I wanted to be. <laughs> Like the oh, economy cruel, will be in the tank world. and therefore there won't be a chip shortage anymore because no one will be buying any chips. Uh, but well, let's hope that's not the, how it rolls. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I will not feel good about my prediction if that's how it rolled. Uh, <laughs> feel the next, real good. The next web's Kate Lawrence uh, does excellent reporting. Go check her out on the next web, uh, dot com. Her latest post is about sand batteries. Uh, sand is an excellent way to store heat. It has, you know, people have known that for a long time. Uh, it can hold temperatures 500, 600 degrees Celsius for months uh, in the right conditions. And Finland's Polar Night Energy is making four by seven meter steel containers with sand in them to take advantage of that. Uh, their implementation uh, is heating the sand by using wind or solar energy when it's available. And then the system can preserve that heat and discharge up to 100 kilowatt hours of heat power. So it's using it to heat homes, offices, factories, swimming pools in the Kankanpa district of Finland. That's about 270 kilometers northwest of Helsinki. Uh, and it's good timing, too. Gas prices have been rising in Finland. Natural gas prices have been rising in Finland uh, lately. So not that this is going to fill the gap, but it's certainly a good time to be experimenting with things that could fill that gap. I'm kind of fascinated by it, um, you know, thermal mass and passive solar heating. stuff is something I've been reading about since I was a very, very small child. Um, uh, and to see it in a place where they're like, this works and it works now and it's a product. And, uh, I, I, you know, I also just want to shout out that the sort of aesthetic they're using on their prototypes, their early versions that they built with this sort of military uh, uh, uh 
yeah if, if you're watching kinda, the video yeah. he's stenciling kind of thing uh which is on and off all over their website i find utterly desirable um but it's interesting i think that uh, i think it's three megawatt hour running test pilots in tampere connect to a local district heating grid provides heats for a couple of buildings and this is really to me this is really exciting uh and also given how hot it has been in the midwest for the last couple of weeks i would like them to start experimenting with cooling the sand as quickly as possible well that that's what i was wondering and i i don't know enough yeah. about it to say maybe somebody out there uh is an engineer who can explain that but could you use the heat that you store in the sand like in a heat pump sort of situation to create energy uh with with that difference i i, I you yeah. know, I wonder what else you can do with this, but but to start with, just using it for heating, certainly in a place like Finland, that where where that's important, uh, makes sense yeah. to me. I would love to learn more about how they're actually insulating these things, but they're talking about mm -hmm. having you know again uh, tremendously high temperatures and being able to store this thermal energy for months, and that is that is interesting and fascinating and deeply. I my curiosity is just amped right now. Indeed. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we have one of those insiders sharing their expertise. Uh, Jay Miller wrote to me, Hey, Tom, listening to DTNS and heard Elastic Search and Elastic. Uh, we were talking about the Shanghai Police Department having a bunch of their information exfiltrated uh, because they had not properly configured their Elastic implementation. Uh, Jay wrote, Up until this year, I worked at Elastic as a developer advocate, and I just recently started at Microsoft. Love that you and Snubs put focus on securing elastic search instances the only thing i would add as somebody familiar to the tech is that elastic has been working to make building these databases secure by default but that requires user adoption the biggest problem uh -oh. i faced trying to encourage people to update was providing a business case for upgrades convincing developers the security updates were worth the time to migrate to more up-to-date versions anyway it doesn't affect me beyond equity but i hope that when these things happen it will lead to people upgrading their software faster he also followed up with a linkedin post from elastics philip kren uh, indicating that a commented out section of code on the shanghai police website might be at fault no confirmation mm -hmm. on that but the you know somebody who knows the space speculating like mm, this could be the problem uh jay said i haven't verified this but it came from my old management team which would have access based on security audits so uh it does seem like that situation is not a bug in elastic as maybe you've heard but but a probably a misconfiguration uh and it's the age-old problem that jay describes of like everybody knows they should be secure but then when it comes time to allocate the time and resources to spend on it people start to go well maybe we can get by for another month yeah maybe this is i was talking to somebody recently about ransomware they were like it'd be very expensive to you know, yeah. back all this information off site. And I'm like, uh huh. And if your business is shut down for multiple weeks, and there was this pause in the confirmation. Well, it's yeah. that thing of like, yeah, but that won't happen to us, will it? It's like, <sighs> maybe not. Maybe you'll be lucky, right? Like, it no one can put all those sure. people not wearing seat belts were thinking yeah. that make up the majority of the vehicular hey deaths man, in the United I, uh, States. I never went through a windshield and I never sat in a car seat as a baby, but I still <laughs> think car seats are a great idea for babies. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Keeps it from crawling around the car. Yeah, that alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Patrick Gordon, thank you as always uh, for, for being with us. Uh, remind folks where they can find the other great work you're doing out there. Uh, well, uh, AVXL, AVXL.com, or search for AVXL on your favorite pod catching tool. Uh, it's the uh, weekly podcast about home theater and audio I host with Robert Heron. Mm -hmm. Go check it out if you're into audio, video, and excelling. It's not about the spreadsheet, <laughs> it's about excellence, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, it never really occurred to me that people might be thinking that's about Excel, the spreadsheet. Now I'm horrified with my name <laughs> invention. I'm going to go cry softly. I hadn't thought about it until that. as those words were coming out of my mouth right then myself. Oh, no. Uh, oh. Thanks to our brand new boss, Craig, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Craig, for keeping the streak alive. Who's going to pick up the ball from Craig? Uh, get great benefits. I just posted a new editor's desk about why we do the show live uh, at the associate producer level. So if you are a listener, if you're especially if you're a new listener, you want to get an ad free version of the show, join Craig, become a new patron at patreon.com slash DTNS, where you'll get the extended show. Good day, Internet, which is going to continue for patrons right after this.
We are live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We liked having Patrick so much. We're going to have him back again tomorrow where he will reunite with his Revision 3 alum, Trish Hershberger. We're going to talk about the return <laughs> of E3. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>